introduce our first speaker. Dr. Edmund Pellegrino is currently the director of the Center for the Advanced Study of Ethics at Georgetown University. Most of you are familiar with the Kennedy Institute for Ethics, which is a part of this larger Center for Advanced Study of Ethics. Uh, Dr. Pellegrino earned his medical degree at New York University. I think I've decided to keep our introductions short. I wish I could go on and on and tell you about these speakers at length because they really are distinguished. And Dr. Pellegrino is especially distinguished with 30-some honorary doctorates. That will tell you something about the esteem with which he is held in this country. He is the author of over 400 publications. I won't bother to read them all to you. <laughs> A very significant recent book, For the Patient's Good, which he wrote with David Thomasma, is a, a significant contribution to uh, the thinking about ethics and health care. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Pellegrino? Good morning. Thank you very much, Dr. Winslow, for that mercifully short introduction. I wish you had read all those uh, 400 publications. I wouldn't have to say anything. And I think you'd all be relieved as well. In keeping with one of the requirements of this conference, which I think is a very important one, that there be discussion, I will not read the 30-page paper I have. And it is here, and it is 35 pages or so. Instead, I'm going to speak from some notes and give you an outline of the major ideas I have covered in the paper. And I understand these papers will be published, and for those of you who lack sufficient judgment to want to read what I have read after you've heard about it, you're welcome to that uh, practice of masochism. It may seem a little puzzling to open a conference on such a practical matter as the setting of limits and the making of the decisions which we as clinicians, and I am still one, and a pseudo-ethicist, must make every day. Indeed, you're probably puzzled by the title, which I did not choose. But I decided to accept the challenge because I thought it was an interesting way of looking at some of these very practical problems. You're going to be immersed in practicality. And for those of you with a pragmatic turn of mind, it may seem indeed perverse to start with talking about philosophy. Philosophy, many of you will say, settles very few problems. The discussions have been going on for centuries. They never tell us anything. And as a matter of fact, we think that most philosophers, even pseudo-philosophers like the present speaker, ought to be given the treatment and the op options that were given to Socrates. <laughs> Voluntary euthanasia, which you'll be hearing about later, with a cup of hemlock. Or, should he fail to take the option, a more definitive, involuntary euthanasia. But having said that, let me reassert the absolute essential place of philosophy in any consideration of the kind that you'll be undertaking. Because underlying any social vision of a policy toward the aged, underlying any of the discussions which you'll be hearing, there will be certain assumptions and presumptions certain starting points, which for the most part will not be made explicit, which every speaker will be using, and which will be the basis for his or her recommendations, assertions, denunciations, rhetoric, or what have you. Like it or not, all human beings must philosophize because we are rational beings. And that means to say that if we're going to be truly liberal, that is freed in our own minds and not be the victims of tyranny of other people's opinions, we need to do some philosophy. And so I want to look, therefore, in this particular 
exercise at the idea of finitude, which is the philosophical concept some people are using as a basis for a philosophy of setting limits. So it's not inappropriate, therefore, for me to start with a look at some of the philosophical questions. My hope is that you will not buy everything I say, that would be ludicrous, but that you will retain one or two of the critical questions I will be raising as you listen to the other powerful, eloquent, informed speakers, remembering always they have a philosophy of life, what human beings are for, what life is about, and what the meaning is of this universal, ineradicable experience of aging and death. Do not let them reduce it to a matter of politics, sociology, or economics. It is a more fundamental question than that, and sociology, politics, and economics, too, must come under critical reflection. Now, to do this, I'm going to simply look at four questions, and one of them I'm going to reduce for a reason I shall give you in a moment. First, why do we need a philosophy of finitude in the first place? I think I have answered that one for you already. To protect your mind and to protect our society from the tyranny of other people's ideas. In a democratic society, we must have a sufficient number of people who are able to think critically so that we are not pushed to the limits that we have seen some societies push to. There are pathological social visions. I am not calling anything of what is about to be said pathological. I merely want you to remember there are diseases of the intellect as there are diseases of the body. But the other questions I want to look at are these. What do we mean by this notion of finitude on which people build their philosophy, some of them? And what is the philosophy of finitude built on that today, the dominant one? And what are some of the logical problems that you ought to look at? Second, what are some of the minimum conditions for an adequate philosophy of fortitude? That already tells you I don't think we have an adequate philosophy. And lastly, to be faithful to my title, in passing, I will talk about what I think the humanities, other than philosophy, which is itself one of the humanistic disciplines, may contribute. This part I'm going to contract, because I'm followed by a worthy successor, by a professor of literature who is far more able to bring the humanities into the subject than I possibly could be as a mere physician. The first question then, what is the concept of finitude and how is it being used to structure a philosophy. Well, you can take finitude in several senses. One, in the dictionary sense, it's simply a statement of the ineradicable fact of human mortality, of the fact that we have death as the end of life, and that we age, and that age is the antechamber to eternity. That's an obvious statement. By itself, it has no ethical presuppositions built into it. It is a starting point for reasoning. It becomes ethical, it becomes philosophical, when we use it to justify a social policy or a personal response to the experience of aging. 
to the experience of finitude. And that brings me to the second meaning of finitude, the philosophical meaning, which is an understanding of what the fact of aging and dying means in human existence. How does it fit into the human condition? How should we respond to it as persons and as a society? How do we who are not afflicted yet with this ineradicable fact of our existence, how do we respond to those who are now in the midst of that human experience? These are not abstract questions. These are the fundamental issues upon which what you're going to be told will turn. There are two dominant philosophies at the moment, in a way, that are being put forth under the name of finitude. And by the way, finitude simply is not the same as setting limits. Setting limits may emerge from what you think about finitude, what its meaning is, but it does not imply per se setting limits. The term, I think, was introduced most formally into biomedical ethics by a distinguished biomedical ethicist, Professor Tristram Engelhardt. Engelhardt drew on some philosophies, sometimes rather difficult to comprehend philosophies, of Hegel and of Hartshorn and of Heidegger. And I'm not going to go into those, so don't worry. In my paper, I do touch upon them. But what he did is draw from them a set of ideas that he called the councils of finitude. That is to say, taking into account that death is a natural part of life, taking into account that we do age, we ought to, and the minute I put the word ought to, you see we've entered into the realm of ethics from an empirical fact. We've moved from biology to philosophy. We ought to accept our finitude as a natural event. Second, that because it exists, we should use it to set limits, to define the priorities in our society, and particularly with reference to those who are in the antechamber of death. By the way, so that you'll realize that I am not distant from this problem, I have passed my 70th year some time ago. So you may want to factor into your assessment of what I say <laughs> my experiential, existential situation vis-a-vis -vis these problems. But I hope that what I'm saying will appeal to your intellect as well as to your emotions. In any case, Engelhardt said we should use it to set limits. We should avoid painful and premature death. But we must balance the death of the individual, consider it not a tragedy, but following Hegel now, as he does rather closely, too closely for my taste, we must look at the death of the individual as a necessity for the advancement of the social and the cultural process. The second <coughs> philosophy of finitude is less explicitly stated. It's the one you referred to, Daniel Callahan's several books on the subject of setting limits. And I think particularly his most philosophical one is the last one, What Kind of Life, in which Professor Callahan raises the question of whether we ought not to change our social values, our whole way of looking at life from a concentration on the care of the individual person, particularly the elderly individual person, and think more in terms of the social impact of our expensive health care system. And he would propose, therefore, that we, like Engelhardt, must set limits on 
how much people can expect in the way of length of life, how much they can expect from public commitment to their health and to their health care after a certain age. And he wants us to look at the social consequences of what we do and put our emphasis, he's more specific here, on preventive medicine. And he wants us to desist from experimentation and research at what he calls the ragged edges of life. Those diseases which afflict primarily the elderly persons, but he doesn't limit it to that. Those diseases which, as he says, are not curable at the present time and probably ought not to spend a great deal of effort trying to cure them because it only means more people consuming more of society's resources and then leading us to the harrowing situation of having nothing left for anything else. Now both Engelhardt and Callahan follow a line of reasoning. If health care costs are being maintained and their driving force is cost, <coughs> economics, social impact, the elderly must learn to accept their finitude, as we've defined it, be prepared to die a timely death at some vaguely defined age, and refuse life-prolonging treatments, curative treatments, be noble and say, no, don't work at Alzheimer's disease and its causation. It'll only keep alive a lot of people with a post poor quality of life. And we must, as elderly people, think of future generations and the young. None of this is intrinsically bad. So please, as I talk about being critical, do not take it as a foregone conclusion. What I'm saying is that look at these questions philosophically, which is to say, what is the evidence, how solid is the argument, before we're going to launch into a social policy, and even more important, accept a social vision. And I'll say more about that later. Now, what are some of the problems, some of the logical problems, I've touched on them already, that I see with this dominant line of reasoning, which I think probably energizes many of the papers that you will hear. And I don't mean to turn your minds against those papers, but I probably will be the only person to say, be careful, respect, and be a bit skeptical. I like to think of the great philosopher George Santayana's definition of skepticism. He called it the chastity of the intellect. It ought not to be yielded up to the first comer. <laughs> this being Saturday, I hope you don't mind my preaching one of the Christian virtues. <laughs> well, let me list just a few of those. And again, I'm drawing a few points from my paper. First, what appears to be a logical analysis of values principles and policies, one against the other, is based in assumptions about the value and the meaning of old age and dying. They take finitude as a given, but they do not justify in any way through an analysis of the notion of finitude, the richer notion, the dictum conclusions to which they come. Second, they tend to treat finitude, this human experience, this facing of the inevitability of our human condition, which each of us faces in different circumstances in different ways, as a problem and not as a human experience and not 
as in a way the mystery it is. And once we remove mystery from life, we then do become reduced to units of production, to items in an economic or fiscal balance sheet. They don't deal with the anxiety, with what Heidegger called the dread of non-being, and it's real, and the vulnerability of those who are aged. To reduce finitude, a complex notion, to simply setting limits and a justification for economic survival is, I would submit, a logical leap from metaphysics to practicality, which is a leap across a chasm they do not close. Third, they assume a philosophy of society which is by no means impenetrable to criticism. They assume that human society, that we, Americans, will not make any sacrifices in our current way of life for the sake of our more vulnerable members. They assume that the young and the middle ages who are not yet in the antechamber but are waiting to be entered to it, who are not yet afflicted with the chronic illness or the decline or the emotional problems of the aged, are willing when they get there to have limits set. Limits of a kind which they may or may not want to accept depending on what kind of sacrifices they want to make. They also overlook in their obsessive concern about technological medicine, and I must say that I am an academic physician and I have been a scientific investigator for a good part of my life, Therefore, you can take what I say with a grain of salt. I want to be honest with you. Nonetheless, they ignore the benefits, economic, social, emotional, of a real technological breakthrough. They just dispose of that. But they do talk about care. But care is the most expensive use of our resources because it's intensive in human labor. And that's the most costly thing. Were we to be able to do something about Alzheimer's, not guarantee immortality, for heaven's sake, but about a disease of that kind, we'd reduce the need, and those of you in this society must have right here before you, people in your families so afflicted. You know the emotional, social, personal costs a technological breakthrough would avoid. And that kind of reasoning is, I believe, fallacious and dangerous. There also are a whole series of non-philosophical, empirical illogicalities in all of the arguments about setting limits. Now, mind you, I want to say at this point, I am not talking about prolonging life indefinitely when a patient is chronically irretrievably ill who is ready to die and has accepted that and their family has accepted. To do that is not ethically defensible. It is irrational medicine. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about setting limits for the elderly persons who are not in that state, because that is the real philosophical problem. Difficult as are the bedside problems of, shall I withdraw from this particular patient, we do have a pretty good set of ethical principles and guidelines that will enable us to deal with that. The green light is on, which means I'm coming to the end of my presentation, I guess. And I haven't gotten to the other points, but I'll go quickly. In any case, Some mistaken notions. One, that there is, in fact, an economic crisis. Can you look in the mirror and say that we have an economic crisis when we look at 
the expenditures of our nation for a whole series of things. Since I'm here with the Seventh-day Adventists, let me say that our $50 billion expenditure for alcohol, our $50 billion expenditure for tobacco, our $50 billion expenditure for treating the consequences of that kind of behavior, our $75 billion expenditure for advertising, our $150 billion expenditure for betting, on one weekend alone, <coughs> we will bet <coughs> $2.3 billion on the outcome of something as inconsequential as the National Football League, Super Bowl. Really, in terms of human life, what does that mean? And yet, we're willing to say, let's set limits on dialysis. What does it cost to keep 100,000 people alive for one year? about $2.9 billion. The price of one weekend's betting, or worse still, what we spent last year on potato chips in America. The question I'm asking you is, what kind of a society do we want to be? That's the fundamental kind of question that hasn't been looked at. Who do we want to be? What kind of persons do we want to be? Are we a society which is so mean-spirited that we will set limits before we get to the lifeboat stage. So what's missing is an ethics of rationing. I do not deny that rationing, which is, by the way, not the de facto distribution of health care by chance, but an orderly, reasonable, rational distribution, I think there's a place for that. But there's an ethics of it. I haven't time to give it to you. I have written about it. That's missing. So. Let me say quickly then, my, my last few moments, uh, money war deficiencies, what I think are the elements of a philosophy of finitude which might serve. I don't have a completed one to give you this morning. But what are some of the elements, the things that ought to be satisfied? First, a fuller meaning of the key term, finitude. What in fact does it mean? And to put into it the human and humanistic dimension which is left out when we look at it through sociology, economics, politics, etc. Second, we cannot leave the development of such a philosophy to philosophy. Now you see there are limitations to philosophy too, as there are limits to medicine. There is no theory of philosophy, utilitarian, deontological, or virtue theory, which can provide a satisfactory foundation for a moral claim on society for the care of the aged. That needs to be looked at, but that can only be developed in association with, and here I defer to my next speaker, the metaphors, the myths, the insights, the experiences that come from literature, from the visual arts, which tell us something about what it is to be old, to be dying, to be a person in this antechamber of death and how we can deal with it personally, either pessimistically or optimistically and so on. So we must, therefore, think of an integrated approach in which the philosophical perception is married to the sociological and the political and, I must say, the theological, which is neglected in most public policy discussions. Like it or not, we are still in America a nation in which, although we are polyglot in our religious beliefs, many of us are still making our decisions, and so are many of your speakers, on the basis of a fundamental commitment to some relationship to a transcendental beyond man. So a secular approach entirely, it must be taken into account, will also be insufficient. Setting of limits must be justified through an ethics of rationing and of setting limits, which is a formal, systematic, critical examination of the ethical problems that are created by a seeming resolution of an economic problem. More than that, we must do something which no society has done in any formal way. We must decide what kind of a society we want to be. But one of the blessings of a democratic society is that we can, in fact, together, discuss our differences and our commonalities 
And we knew to develop, we need to develop some kind of a vision of what we can tolerate and what we cannot tolerate as a group. A communitarian notion, which both Engelhardt and Callahan, to their great credit, bring in. Too much of ethics is individualistic today. The red light is on, but I will be, I'll be stopping. That question of what kind of a society I consider to be absolutely intrinsic. Let me close with one brief reminder. None, none of this is new. Ecclesiastes was absolutely right. There's nothing new under the sun. Sumner, in his folk ways, points out that the primitive societies had two ways of looking at the aged. One was to revere them for their sagacity and their wisdom and so on, which is a little bit romantic. We aren't that wise. But at least as the holders of tradition and as a vulnerable segment. I'm not speaking now of the wealthy aged. The other approach was to decide, no, they are a burden. They're a drag on our society. And they ought to be offered two options. The option Socrates was offered. Either voluntary suicide or socially mandated euthanasia. Those are not new ideas. They have yet to be examined critically. Sumner points out again in his folk ways that the difference depended upon whether there was scarcity. And the question I ask you is, have we shown any greater wisdom than our primitive forebears? Or have we advanced intellectually and morally to the point where we will not immediately accept sagacity as a justification for a philosophy of finitude? Thank you very much.